Okay, so let me first uh, thank the organizers for this very kind invitation to talk uh, today. Um, so I, I'm going to tell you about some works um, on, on the emergence of long time scales in data driven network models of zebrafish activity. So this work is a, is a collaboration, actually it's the result of a collaboration between an exper experimental team, and I will cite all the people involved uh, at the end of the talk, and also the uh, more theoretical team we, we have at, uh, at the Economal. Okay, so, um, so one very basic question we are all interested in, in in computational neuroscience is how computation can be actually performed or carried out by circuits. So what I'm, I'm, this is an obvious cartoon that we have already seen many, many times, but suppose we, we look at the circuits, which is defining some kind of brain area. Then this circuit will receive some inputs. They may be sensory inputs, or they may be inputs coming from uh, high level areas. And it will uh, update its states according to some dynamical rules. And maybe also it's the, the very circuit itself through some plasticity, for instance, and then produce some outputs. So one of the basic questions is how the circuit is actually processing the inputs, updating the states and to produce the right computation and, and the right mapping onto the outputs. So, so this is a very vague question, but uh, this is actually a question which is pervasive, obviously. So there are different strategies to actually try to answer this question in, in specific uh, ways. So the first one, I would call it the top-down approach. So we may have actually, uh, we may actually guess or identify the key mechanisms which underlie the function. And then we may want to buy, uh, to build, sorry, a, a theoretical model, which uh, we suppose is actually going to, to do the job and then analyze it mathematically. Then of course, if we want to have some agreement with the data, then th there will be some parameters to, to fit in the model. But then of course, if the model is not too complicated so that we could actually analyze it mathematically, that means that maybe it won't fit exactly the data. So we look for a refined model and so on. So this approach has been uh, followed for decades, it's extremely useful to provide concepts. For instance, uh, we had some talks over the past uh, weeks about attractor uh, neural networks. And, but the problem with that is that the, the detailed comparison with data is difficult uh, and it's often qualitative. So another approach which has emerged over the, the, the past years is kind of bottom-up approach. When we can actually start from data, so we can have, for instance, detailed recordings of the activity also of the inputs, if you think about the retina, you can have uh, the, all the stimuli which are presented. Um, and then we would like to learn maybe complex model from the data. So using some machine learning procedure. Then of course, uh, the, the model we learn can be actually quite successful. So it can make maybe quantitative predictions, but the problem is how to understand what it does. So the idea could be, for instance, we can identify some relevant collective degrees of freedom and principal component analysis is just a very basic version of that then we can use that to simplify the model and iterate. But I mean, the problem with this approach is that actually understanding the mechanism is, is maybe very complicated and we, we may actually uh, fall into the, the, the black, box, black box effect. So that actually we have a very good model practically, but we don't really understand what it does. So I would like to advocate in this talk for a, a kind of mix of combined approach uh, where we actually start uh, from detailed recordings of the activity with hundreds of neurons and we will learn a model which capture some microscopic features of the data, not all of them, you will see the limitations, but we, we have some, some, um, a lot of, of features, statistical features which are captured by the model. Yet the model is still amenable to uh, theoretical analysis. And so we can analyze the, this kind of data-driven model and uh, unveil the mechanisms which underlie the function. So here, uh, the goal is actually to kind of reach a trade-off between quantitative adequacy with data and some kind of precise understanding of the circuit functioning or operation. So let me, uh, let me try to be more precise. So what uh, I'm going to talk about is a special circuit of zebrafish, which is called the ARTR. So I will define that uh, in the following. And this circuit is crucial to swimming and gaze orientation. And it has the uh, important property of showing persistent activity. On time scales, which may reach uh, about 10 seconds, uh, which are much, much larger than any kind of cellular time scale for a single neuron. So one of the questions we ask is how actually these long time scales can, can emerge from the circuit. So uh, I will first um, present the experimental facts. I mean, some, some uh, very short summary of experimental facts known about the uh, ARTR. 
and which motivate this study. And then I will uh, present how we do a data-driven modeling of the uh, large-scale uh, recordings of this circuit. And we will use graphical models. And I will show you all the way from inference to simulation of the model, what we can do and show that actually they uh, behave as, as we can see, what we can see from the data. And then finally, um, I will try to do a theoretical analysis of the data-driven model to really understand how it works. Because it's not sufficient to compare it to data but we really want to understand its mechanisms. So we'll derive the phase diagram of this model and, and also some dynamical features, how it, it actually implements some activity dynamics between different states. Okay, so let me start with the, um, some of the experimental facts. So not being an experimentalist, I hope I, I won't say too, too many wrong things, but I mean, what we are interested in here is the zebrafish, which is a model organism. Um, so um, zebrafish are uh, fr freshwater fish, uh, which are native to South Asia. For instance, in India, uh, they are uh, easily found. And they live in water temperature. Uh, so in, they live in, in fresh water uh, at temperatures uh, ranging between 16 to 35 Celsius degrees. So there is a large range of, of, of temperatures which are uh, possible for, for these fish. So this fish can be observed. So it can be characterized, and here you see uh, a video which was done uh, by, by Raphael Candelier uh, and collaborators. And uh, so the, the, the way this fish is actually uh, swimming can be um, uh, analyzed so we can have, have access to many trajectories. And um, so this is useful because then this, this can help characterize the motion of a fish. And if we uh, consider one fish, or let's say actually it's, it's a larvae, so about one week after uh, birth, uh, here and then the reason why we look at, at um, uh, early stage of development is, will be um, very clear later on. Then, um, then this larvae that you can see on the left part of the screen here, which is about uh, you know a few millimeter uh, long, is actually moving in an environment with uh, constant or let's say uniform light conditions, and the trajectory can be decomposed as a sequence of discrete boots. And these boots uh, during the, this discrete boot, the animal is actually moving straight, and you see a, a sequence here. And then at, at the end of the boot, there is a, a, a change of the angle, alpha, with respect to some fixed uh, uh, direction. And uh, what is interesting is to look at this, uh, at the successive change of angle. So delta alpha between the boots number n and the boots, let's say n plus one and boots number n. So you see on the right uh, part of the of slide, the distribution of these uh, differential uh, angles. Um, and there are two, um, the main contribution to this distribution is a superimposition of two Gaussians. One corresponds to uh, very small angles. So that, that would say is something, it's the, the, they correspond to boots where the animal is just moving forward without changing its angle. Essentially, it's very weak here. And, but we may see also some very large deviation, the large uh, delta alpha to the left here or to the right, which correspond to these big uh, uh, reorientation events that are seen along the trajectory. So the fish navigates through discrete boots, either forward or turning left or right. So, um, so what can we say about the time dynamics of this uh, reorientation events? So now let me just consider that uh, I, I forget about the absolute value of, of, of the change of the angles. And let's say we'll binaries, binarize the, the data. So we have, for instance, the plus one variables when the fish is turning left, or a minus one or zero variable when it's turning uh, right. And we can look at the persistent time, the distribution of the time corresponding to uh, uh, reorientation to the left or to the right. So what can be seen is that actually the time correlation of these of these events is actually decreasing exponentially over long times. So you see here long times of, of, of the order of few seconds. And in fact, um, the data are compatible with the Poisson process for uh, changing from left to right and from right to left with some rate K flip, which is just the inverse of the mean time here corresponding to, to the decay time of this exponential. So uh, an interesting fact is that this rate of flipping from, from left to right is actually very much dependent on temperature. So here you see three trajectories corresponding to three fish at different temperatures, um, which are more or less, let's say, the extreme, extreme temperatures that a fish can actually uh, um, experience in natural conditions between 18 and 33 degrees. And you see that trajectories at low temperature are much more persistent in the sense that they are, uh, the direction is much more conserved for a longer time than trajectories at high temperature. So that means that this K flip is actually 
increasing with temperature. So the inverse of K flip, which is its persistence time, is decreasing. And you see here in the bottom right of the slide the value of K flip with the uh, temperature, and that corresponds to time uh, ranging between two and ten seconds, depending on temperature. Okay, so. Um, so this is the behavior, spontaneous behavior of the fish. And now what can we say about, um, let's say the circuits which are involved in actually uh, controlling the direction of the, uh, of the, of the tail and the, the beats of the tail, which allow for this change of angles. So, uh, so a lot of groups, experimental groups have been interested in, in looking at the zebra fish and larvae because actually that's a transparent animal at the beginning of development. And here I show the device, uh, the setup, which was uh, actually um, um, organized and, and mounted in the in George de Brazas group um, in Sorbonne University, our experimental collaborators. And uh, so what they are doing is um, uh, light sheet microscopy where uh, a larvae of the, of, of the fish, of a zebra fish, is actually uh, fixed in an agar uh, tube here. And um, the, uh, this zebra fish is actually uh, genetically modified so that actually um, the neuron uh, includes calcium sensitive uh, probes, fluorescent probes, so that actually uh, when the neuron becomes active, uh, we can actually measure the fluorescent uh, light the, which is emitted and have a, a 2D map uh, of the active neurons. And by changing the, the plane of this light sheet, then we can have a, a full reconstruction of the 3D brain. So this technique is, is extremely uh, powerful and can actually uh, give access to the activity of of tens of thousands of neurons. So, um, so now, what are the uh, the circuits which are involved in these uh, in these tail beats? So, um, the the this question was investigated by by Dunn and New and collaborators about four years ago. And what they have done is that they have used exactly the techniques I've shown, except that of course when the animal is actually uh, um, really uh, immobile uh, in the in in the tube, then you cannot measure the, the, the tail beat. So what they did is that they look at the paralyzed fish and they measure as a proxy for the tail beats the activity of the motor nerves uh, with the electrodes, so extracellular recording of this activity. So you see here the uh, extracellular activity of the left and the right nerves, and essentially, roughly speaking, the sum of the two gives you the total is, is a proxy for the total amplitude of the beats. And um, the difference tells you something about the orientation, whether it's more to the left or to the right. So now this uh, signal, this time signal can be correlated to the activity of all the neurons, which are, uh, that you can see here from the fluorescent signal. And we can uh, isolate from this recording only the neurons which are correlated to the signal. So which has a strong correlation with, the, uh, with this proxy signal for the motion of, of the tail. And you can see here in this, uh, in this plot that one particular region is uh, very much correlated to the activity um, of, of the tail, and uh, which is measured here. So this is, this is a very strong signal here in the left nerve, here in the right nerve. And you see that this corresponding region is actually synchronized very much with the signal here. So this is a very good candidate for the circuit controlling uh, the tail. And this region is called the anterior rhombencephalic turning region, ARTR. So it's, it's very important actually, uh, this region, not only for the tail, but also because it's related to the motion of, of the eyes. And this is a result of, of a work done by uh, Sebastian Wolf, Alexi Duay and collaborators in the Debajas group. And uh, what they have shown is that you can see that the, the eyes of the fish are doing some saccades on a 10 second time scale. And when the saccade starts and the eyes move to from the left to the right, then the corresponding region in the ARTR is flashing and very much active. Okay, so this is very important. And in fact, this is not only a matter of correlation, but also a causality matter, because by optogenetically um, simulating this region, then the, the eyes are changing direction. So this has led uh, to the following suggestion that actually the ARTR could be a very central circuit, a hub for sensory motor computation underlying photo phototaxis. So since the, uh, the ARTR is controlling the eyes and also controlling there is a good evidence that it's controlling also the tail, then um, the signals, uh, uh, light signals, which can be actually uh, measured by the eyes, could actually uh, change the activity of the RTR, and that was shown in, in this work I'm citing here, and for instance, produce some uh, reorientation of, of the tail so that the animal is actually following the region with where the light intensity is higher. So that's the basis for phototaxis. Okay, so this is a circuit we are interested in. It contains about, uh, let's say, four to 500 neurons. 
So now, um, uh, what about the data-driven data -driven modeling of the activity here? So we, uh, starting from the fluorescent signal uh, of uh, hundreds of neurons, which uh, were recorded by, uh, uh, by the people in the Debrechas group. And uh, the first uh, step uh, is actually to do a blind deconvolution of a fluorescent signal uh, to infer some spikes. So one problem here is that the time resolution is far from being perfect. Uh, we have a few hundred millisecond time resolution, but still, I mean, this is uh, a time resolution which is very uh, sufficient uh, with respect to the phenomena we want to study, which take place on, on, on the order of a few seconds, I, have, I explained before. So, um, so this blind deconvolution was, uh, a spike inference was uh, done by, by Jérôme Tuliana and, and, and Sébastien. And, and um, so we, st we, we had the, all the timing, uh, the spike uh, uh, timings uh, of these uh, hundreds of neurons. So let's say roughly half and half of the recording neurons are in the left area and the other half are in the right area. So once we have a raster plot or some estimate of a raster plot, uh, then we can start uh, uh, designing our uh, data-driven model. So we will use, um, so a procedure which was uh, first uh, put forward by uh, Schnellman and, and, and Bialek and collaborators uh, about 15 years ago. And uh, what they did is the following thing. So, we first uh, time beams the activity. So we had he here the different neurons at different times. So we use time beams of the order of a few hundred milliseconds, which correspond to the time resolution. And um, now we can measure the activity of each neuron in each time beam. And we will just discretize this activity with a variable which is zero if the neuron is silent and one if it emits uh, one spike or at least one spike. So we have therefore the mean activity over all the time beams that we represent here as a variable between zero and one for all the neurons. And we have also, we measure also the pairwise covariance, which is the uh, probability that uh, neuron i and j are active together in the time beam. So I want to insist here on a very important fact. We don't uh, collect any kind of statistical feature about time correlation here. We just measure population activity in time beams and compute the first and the second point correlation. So some information which is available in the data is discarded here. I'll come back to that later. Okay, so once we had this uh, one and two point statistic, then we built a model. Uh, we built a, a model which is a, a graphical model called Ising model in statistical uh, physics, obviously, where we have some local fields which uh, represent neural ex uh, excitabilities of the different neurons. So it depends on the particular neurons we are looking at. And also some effective couplings. So some kind of functional connectivity patterns between the neurons. So uh, the role of these parameters can be seen here in the conditional firing probability of neuron I in a time beam. So the probability that neuron I will be active, for instance, uh, sigma I equal to one, uh, depends on the states of the other neuron, sigma J, with J different from I. And it will be a sigmoidal function of this uh, local excitability specific to this particular neuron I, plus the sum of the inputs uh, coming from the other neurons. And there will be this effective uh, connectivity GIJ uh, matrix here. Okay, so um, it's a non-trivial problem to infer all these parameters because now if you have 300 neurons, which is typically what we have in the data set, that represents about 45,000 parameters. So it's a non-trivial inference problem. It requires regularization and so on, but that can be done with some techniques we have developed over the past years. And there are uh, now a bunch of algorithms which are able, available to do that. Um, and then, uh, so at the end of the game, we have a model. So I just want to insist here on what the model can do and what the model cannot do. So what the model can do, it can, first of all, it should reproduce the one and two point statistics of the recorded activity because it, it is specially trained to do that. So uh, in order to do that, it offers the patterns of local excitabilities and functional connectivity, which are these uh, fields HI and, and capping JIJ. So it does more, and this is where it becomes, I think, interesting. It defines a probability distribution over all configurations. So if we have n neurons, in principle, for all two to the 300 neurons, uh, we know the probability of this uh, particular uh, uh, spiking configuration, so a set of one and zeros. And this is defined here as the exponential of some minus some energy, statistical energy, which is given by this, uh, by this expression. So we, if, we, if we know that, then we can sample this probability distribution, which can be used to predict the values of observables, which can be compared to the data, but it can also be used to generate new activity configuration. And, and we will do both in the following. 
So, uh, but there are also things that the model cannot do. First of all, as I said before, it does not capture any kind of time correlation between time beams. This is completely discarded. Actually, it, it discards also some information about what happens within a time beam. So if I consider, for instance, two neurons, the blue and the, the orange one, for me, uh, with this model, this time beam configuration here is the same as that one. So there is no time ordering in, within a time beam, which means that the couplings Jij are just symmetric couplings. So there is no notion of causality of anything here. One other thing that the model can do or cannot do, depending on the point of view, is that actually it can distinguish within the definition of the model, the true interaction or effective interaction within the recorded areas from common inputs coming from the other neurons. But it cannot do that uh, for the common inputs coming from the neurons which are not recorded. So we should always think that the effective connectivity in pattern we have here is actually very much dependent on what is going on here around. And, and we have no access to that. OK, anyway. Um, so what can we do with this model so we can sample it? And I want to just to say how we do that. So we infer for given fish and temperature, uh, the set of parameters here. So we have, uh, as I said, uh, 45,000 parameters here. So that defines a completely our model. And we can run a Monte Carlo simulation to sample the corresponding distribution of probability of all activity configuration. So here I show on the left, some raster plots coming from data, real recordings after the spike inference. And uh, the bottom here, is just the mean activity of neurons here uh, in the left area. This is the red one. Do you see this curve going from zero to one? Um, and also the blue here, raster plot, gives the mean activity that you see here. Now we can do exactly the same thing with the model. So we just run our Monte Carlo simulation and we can uh, just build raster plots. Obviously, the time scale here is not second, it's Monte Carlo rounds, so there is nothing physical here. But you see some, um, some superficial analogy between the two. It seems that we have also these bursts of activity here and also some kind of alternance between the, the blue and the red activities. So now I would like to, just to show how this, um, uh, the, the um, activities uh, generated by the model can be actually compared to the data. So we'll do quantitative comparison for the statistical properties. And also I will do a, statistic, uh, a comparison of the dynamical properties which sounds a little bit crazy because I, again, we, the model knows nothing about the dynamics. It's just Monte Carlo dynamics here. So just an example of what we can do from a statistical point of view. Uh, point of view. So for instance, here we have the model, it's just a time trace uh, generated uh, with Monte Carlo simulation. So we can, for instance, uh, estimate the probability that the activity in the left uh, area is high, that is larger than some threshold theta, and it's low in the, uh, uh, right area, so the blue activity here. Um, so, and, and I show you exactly what we find in the data. So this is a scatter plot here along the X axis and what we find in the model for a given value of a threshold, which is 0.1, that can be changed obviously. And you see that the points at all temperatures and for all fish we have a line uh, quite well. And this is a non-trivial prediction of the model because what we are estimating is actually this probability, we are estimating the probability that about 150, the sum about 150 neurons here are above theta. And the sum here of the other remaining 150 neurons is below theta. Or that should be normalized by one of the n, the number of neurons in each area, sorry. And um, this probability cannot be easily be deduced from the one and two point statistics. That, that's the only information we use for the training of the model. So that means the model can predict some non-trivial observable. So it captures something about the, the true distribution. So now from the dynamical point of view, what we can do is just run the Monte Carlo simulation. And again, as you see in, in the data, uh, we have some time scales I've already talked about when I, I, I did this very brief review of experiments. And in, in the Monte Carlo simulation, we see also some characteristics time scale. Uh, this, is, this is clear from, from, from this picture here. So we can do something more precise by, as we would do you know, when running an experiment, we can explain the time scale so what we do is we, we can do the Fourier transform of the signal, compute the square modulus, which is just a power spectrum and look at the cutoff frequency. And the inverse is actually a, a typical time scale in the model. And if you do that for all the uh, experimental data set we have, then you can compute uh, what you get from the data set and what you, what you get from the model trained on this data set only from the one and two point statistics. And you see there is a kind of linear relationship between the two. So the, the scale here is seconds, here it's Monte Carlo rounds, which means obviously nothing. 
Okay, so how is it possible that actually when we do uh, Monte Carlo dynamics of this model, which knows nothing about the real neural dynamics, we find something which seems to match up to some conversion factor uh, between rounds and second, the true neural dynamics. So I think there are two key ingredients here. First of all, the neural dynamics and the Monte Carlo dynamics are local in configuration space. We do not imagine that in an extremely short amount of time, a large fraction of the neurons can change state immediately. And then what we see in the, uh, in the model, and you will see that in more details in the following, is that the dynamics is actually activated. I mean, what happens is that the system is most of the time energetically trapped. And, and we know in chemistry and in physics that actually when we have uh, activity dynamics, most of the microscopic details about the uh, short-term dynamics are totally irrelevant. So for instance, you can think about a chemistry where we have molecules, we have two molecules which should interact uh, somewhere here, and then there will be a product of, the, uh, of this reaction. So that should be just the opposite, sorry, the left or right here, but that doesn't matter. So we, we go from one state to another one. And we know that the transition time is actually only depends on the, on the barrier here, the height of the barrier, this is just R in a slope. And um, it depends exponentially on the, on the barrier height. And where well, KBT here is temperature. And the, all the details, the microscopic details about how the states here are explored is just a prefactor here. So in fact, even if we don't really uh, uh, define correctly the, the, the microscopic dynamics, exploration dynamics, this law will remain exact. And the main factor here depends only on the landscape, on the probability landscape of the configuration of the system. So we, we believe this is what is going on also in our the data driven model. Okay, so, so I, I arrived at the last part of the talk where I, I want to actually use the model we had inferred. So remember it's a model where we have actually um, about uh, three to 400 neurons. So it's, uh, it, and we have many, many um, interaction parameters. So actually we can run it on the computer and simulate it, that's very easy, but it's not easy to understand what it does. I mean. It's, it's certainly much simpler than the, than the zebrafish. Still, it's not something very simple to understand. Okay, so can we actually uh, um, bypass this kind of black box problem issue here? Uh, yes, we can because um, this is um, an Ising model and, and we know a lot of techniques in statistical mechanics to deal with the Ising models. So what we have done is actually we have uh, derived some a mean field theory for this inferred Ising model. So um, in practice, how do we do that? We have our Ising model with a few hundred neurons with all the parameters, which are summarized here. You see the distribution of the uh, local fields, HI, as an index of the neurons in the left uh, part of the uh, ARTR in the right part here. And you have this big connectivity matrix, uh, which corresponds to ipsilateral connection within this red area, uh, within the blue area here, and in between uh, the blue and the red areas here contralateral connections. So what we do, we will actually um, simplify this matrix here and compute the mean value in each one of the four quadrants here. So for instance, in the red-red connections, for the red-red connection, we will compute the mean value of these connections. And this is some J, which is actually positive. We have uh, excitatory uh, connections on average here. So we will replace the whole details here by a single number. Uh, and then we can do the same thing in the other area. So here we get on average that this, the, the mean coupling here is actually negative. We have an inhibition between the two areas which correspond to this alternance between high activity in the, in the, uh, in the left and the, the right areas. So that we have a much simpler model in the sense that each neuron is actually seeing all the neurons in the same area with the same intensity of the couplings. And if you go back now to this conditional probability I was mentioning here, since I can factor out J here from the sum, I can leave it out from the sum here. You see what, what is left is actually the mean, the sum over the sigmas inside each region, which is the, the mean activity I was uh, showing here in this plot, right? So we, we see naturally the emergence of these order parameters, which are the mean activities of, of the two regions. So this is why the model is actually mean field-like when we do that. Now for the local fields here, actually the diversity of the field is actually very important, so we'll keep it. So to a good approximation, the distribution of a local field uh, is a Gaussian distribution with some mean value H and some, some standard deviation eta. So we end up with four parameters, which are uh, the couplings within a region, 
the couplings between the, the left and the, 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 the right uh, areas, which is negative. Sorry, there is no minus here. It's just I is negative. Uh, the mean value of the local fields and the standard deviation. So um, we have 25 data sets corresponding to, corresponding to different fish and temperatures. So that means we have 25 values of these parameters, of these four parameters. OK, so since this is the mean field model, then the analytical treatment is possible. So we can compute, for instance, the probability that um, the mean activity in the left area is ML. This is the mean activity per neuron. This is normalized. And the uh, mean activity in the right area is MR. So here I assume for simplicity that the number of neurons in both areas is the same, uh, which is close to what is uh, ha happening in experiment. But sometimes there are some little biases. So we have to modify a little bit the formula in that case. So this probability can be written as exponential minus n times some, some uh, large deviation function, if you want, in probability terms, or let's say a free energy in statistical physics, or minus log likelihood in statistical terms. And this, um, this free energy is a function of ML, MR, and it's also a function of our parameters, which is the mean coupling J, the other mean inhibitory coupling I, and the distribution of the fields. Remember, a Gaussian with average value capital H and standard deviation eta. So this is a, we have everything now. So we can plot um, F as a function of ML and MR. So we'll have the free energy landscape. We can find its minima, which are the best sets of activity configuration with the, the largest probability. And we can find also transition paths between the minima. So I want to, to show how to do that. So here are the uh, uh, free energy landscape, which correspond to three different um, data sets. So you see, let's start with the right. So you see here a situation which actually takes place at high temperature, water temperature, where uh, the free energy landscape has only one minimum, which corresponds to low activity um, uh, in both areas. But of course, there could be deviations, because you see, even if we have a minimum here, there will be deviations around these uh, fluctuations around this uh, minimum here, which are controlled by the, by, by the inverse of the size of the, of the network. So uh, the system will remain trapped here. We may find also another regimes where we have at least three minima, one which is the low, low activity uh, in both regions, but one, on, on two other minima which correspond to one region which has high activity and the other has low activity. So it's a symmetric landscape here. And also we may find a regime where actually there is also another minimum where both uh, regions have high activity. So uh, where are we depending on the particular data set? So we can plot this phase diagram here. So if actually we have four parameters. Remember, we have J, H, we have also I and eta. So I plot here only a two uh, dimensional uh, phase diagram. So when the other parameters are uh, given the value that are computed from the data. And you see here our 25 data sets corresponding to different fish or different temperatures. So the color code for temperatures is given here in this scale. Uh, so at high temperature, essentially we are uh, in this P phase, parametric phase with only one minimum. And as uh, temperatures decrease, we move towards this 4S uh, phase with four different minima. And in fact, if we move along this direction OD here in this two-dimensional plane, uh, we see a very clear distinction between high, temperature, uh, high temperatures here, sorry, and low temperatures here. Uh, in fact, the fact that this direction is much more important than the orthogonal direction can be understood very easily. If we have a mean field system, if we change the value of a coupling J into J plus delta J, and then we can make a compensatory change of H for local fields, H minus M times delta J, where M is the magnetization of the system, but doesn't change the effective field, which is H plus J M. Uh, so that explains here uh, that um, uh, then um, what happens in the direction orthogonal to this uh, gauge invariance is actually uh, not affecting the phase diagram. So everything happens, or most of the things happen here in this direction. So we see these different phases. So are they, uh, can we compare to what is seen in the data? So in the data, obviously, the, we don't have such an accuracy as an analytical prediction. But we can look at, um, at different data sets. So these are uh, three data sets at, at three different temperatures. So at high temperature here on the right. Um, so I, I'm not showing minus the log of probability. But here um, in this plot, you see the, the uh, probability uh, of having a certain uh, couple of uh, of activity on the left and on right areas. So you see most of the time means correspond to very low activity. And it's decreasing when we, we go to higher activity regions. So that's, that is very much what we expect in this parametric phase. 
as you decrease the temperature, and let's look at, the, at this low temperature here, you see that we observe some uh, weak, but I mean, clear peaks here, which correspond to high activity in one region and essentially zero activity in the other regions. And sometimes we see also some peak here, which is definitely of a lower height than the other one, but it seems that there is a local maximum here, which would be correspond to this, uh, to this phase diagram here, to this uh, typical uh, landscape here. So for fish, which are there in the phase diagram. Okay, so we can do much more, and I don't think I'd have much time to, to go further, but let me just say that um, once we have this very simple description, effective description in terms of two other parameters, then we can do a Langevin dynamics to sample uh, the free energy landscape. And this is uh, the effective Langevin dynamics you can, you can uh, immediately write. Um, and so this is a stochastic dynamics with an effective temperature, which is one over the size of the system, one over N. You see that N is actually playing the role of the one of the, of the inverse temperature in this formula here. And if you simulate uh, this uh, Langevin equation, you will see time traces, which are similar to what we see in the data um, in, in qualitative terms. And we can also compute the optimal transition path between the states and so the barriers between the paths, uh, along the path, sorry, which actually control uh, the long time dynamics. So one last thing I would like to show, with, which is uh, some kind of uh, related to, to this uh, mean field approach, is that we can also um, use it in order to understand what is going on at inversion time. So when uh, the tail is uh, um, flipping from the left orientation to the uh, right orientation, so that corresponds to high activity here in the left area of the ARTR, and then it moves to the, to the um, high activity, it, it shuts down, and then the uh, right area now acquires a high activity. So we can define the latency time of each neuron, which is the first time at which each neuron will spike after the inversion. And we can average over all the inversion uh, events we have in the data. And you see that there is a clear correlation of this uh, inver latency time for neuron I with the um, field, local field acting on neuron I. So the, the higher the field, the smaller the latency. So this is somewhat expecting since uh, uh, neurons with higher fields are more uh, likely to be active. But we can actually understand that in more details because uh, we'll have an effect which is some kind of avalanche effect. So if we start right before the, in the inversion in a region uh, at a moment where the right uh, area is active and the left neurons are inactive, so they are all silent, at some point when the inversion takes place at time t equals zero to zero, the first neurons in the left area will start to be active. So when we neurons it, it becomes active, since the mean couplings with the other neurons in the area are positive, then it will drive the effective fields of most of the neurons toward the, the right. Their effective field will increase compared to their local fields, HI. So some of them may be just move a little bit to the left if we have just a bunch of negative couplings, but most of them will be moved to the right, which means that then they will become activated and so on. And then the front will propagate all over the place and the whole area will, will, uh, will um, be activated. So this is very analogous to what people call back cause and effect in, 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 in magnetic domains. And, and this phenomenon is important to actually have a very fast propagation, much faster than if the neurons were un uncoupled. Okay, so I think I should stop um, here because we, are, we have already spent 45 minutes. So let me just conclude. Um, so what I've presented here is a, is a kind of mixed data-driven and theoretical approach to persistence in the Zografish uh, ARTR circuit. So this is the result of some kind of, let's say, trade-off between having a model which is fitted from data and which fits a lot of, of the microscopic features of the data, but remains still amenable to uh, detailed analytical uh, analysis. So the model has no knowledge about the neural dynamics, but what matters is that it shapes the probabilistic landscape of configuration in such a way that when we run some kind of artificial stochastic local dynamics, um, then on, and, and we do it on, on time scales which, uh, which are long, then this uh, local dynamics may sample the landscape and determine the long time behaviors with, with an agreement with what is seen on long time scales in the data. And the reason is that the long time scales are due to the activity processes. With, so we have kinetic trapping here. And we don't need any additional features like adaptation or even fine tuning in order to see that. So uh, we can analyze a lot of things like fluctuation within the preferred states the transition between the states, the inversions, as I, I spoke uh, about very briefly, and all these things can be characterized um, in a quantitative way. 
So one last thing I would like to say is that the model can be also used to understand the effects of perturbations. So we can think about two perturbations which were done uh, experimentally. Um, so for instance, transient changes in, in temperature. So you can actually uh, have a pulse of hot or cold water onto the fish and measure its activity in the ARTR and see how it's, it's uh, driven by these uh, pulses uh, with negative or positive uh, change in temperature. You can also do a transient light stimulation. So it's, it's more complicated, it has to, do, uh, to be done with a two photon uh, microscope uh, device. Uh, but then you know that the light uh, coming onto the, uh, the, the left and the right eyes can be actually uh, changed. Uh, and then this can be uh, introduce some, some um, uh, um, effects on the, in the ARTR and we can actually use the model to see whether the effects which are measured are compatible with the model. And they are. And what happens is that essentially the landscape I've shown before are changing, the barriers are changing, everything is moving. And we see how the, uh, the um, coordinates in the MLMR planes of the activities are actually moving as a, as a result of these perturbations. Okay, so uh, last of all, and this is uh, certainly very important, I want uh, so to mention all the people who did the work uh, here. So most of the work was done by, by Sebastian Wolf. So Sebastian is a postdoc uh, at ENS in the physics and biology department. And Sebastian actually, um, before he, he was doing his postdoc, he's doing his postdoc at ENS, actually was a PhD student in the Debrechers group uh, at Sorbonne University in the Laboratoire Champion. And he did experiments on the zebra fish and now he's doing analysis with us. So, um, so at ENS, also Simona uh, has been doing uh, a lot, and she she's um, has developed the algorithm to do uh, the inference of this uh, Ising model from the data. And uh, in the Laboratoire Champerin, uh, in the group uh, led by Georges de Prejas, uh, Guillaume Le Goc also has done a lot about these uh, um, experiments on uh, changing the water temperature. And I want also to thank uh, Alexis Dubois, uh, who was part at the beginning of this uh, of his story uh, of. Um, of studying uh, zebrafish and, uh, and, and doing some inference. 